Despite its recent surge in popularity with the rise of cryptocurrency and NFTs, the concept of digital ownership is not a new one in gaming, even less so in MMORPGs, games famous for the scale and immersion of their worlds. MMOs are designed to be lived in as much as played, and as a result of the extreme time and social commitment these games can require, commodities collected by players can develop real-world value. Black Snow Interactive, a secondary seller of MMO items based out of Orange County, California, were among the first to understand the potential of this new digital frontier. Black Snow brought in a profit of $30,000 to $40,000 a month, selling items from games like Ultima Online, Dark Age of Camelot, and EverQuest. They also claimed to outsource much of their item farming 100 plus miles to the south to Tijuana, Mexico, where workers were allegedly paid $19 a day to harvest various items from online games. The existence of this so called called Loot Farm was never explicitly proven, but the idea of hiring other players to grind for in-game resources would soon become quite common. Black Snow seemed to have a pretty solid business on their hands. That was, until their accounts were suspended by Mythic Entertainment, the producers of Dark Age of Camelot. Mythic alleged that Black Snow Interactive's sales infringed upon their copyright, but Black Snow would fight back and take the issue to court. This court battle would start to open up the complex issues at the heart of the MMORPG genre. As Julian Dibble puts it in his book, Play Money, this lawsuit started to ask questions like, who actually owns the wealth of virtual worlds? The companies who create those worlds or the players who fuel their economies? Here were the traditional economics of the intangible being stretched to the point of surreality. Ultima Online. Go beyond life as you know it to an adventure more incredible than you can imagine. Even before Black Snow Interactive, Ultima Online experienced plenty of this strange new phenomenon. In Ultima, players could, with enough time, effort, and in-game currency, build houses throughout the world, giving players a safe space to rest and store their items. Because Ultima Online's housing was non-instanced, meaning homes took up real space on the map, it meant that there was only room for about 3,000 houses on servers that held up to 30,000 players. Unsurprisingly, these spaces quickly developed huge demand. Since houses could be placed almost anywhere in the world, it also meant that certain plots of land became much more valuable than others. So in order to help fight the extreme demand for these housing spots, and to ensure that they weren't monopolized by inactive players, Ultima utilized a system of housing decay. After enough time had passed without upkeep on a home, a house would begin to decay until it was in danger of collapsing, at which point it would collapse after a randomized interval. When a house reached this state, it would cause players to gather like vultures in the hopes of being the first player not only to claim the plot, but also whatever items the previous player had stored inside the home. Needless to say, these could be tense and sometimes violent affairs. Still, according to Ultima's creator Richard Garriott, it was not unheard of for a particularly nice plot of land in Ultima Online to sell for over $10,000 on a site like eBay when the game released in 1997. But Ultima Online isn't the only game to have passed through this bizarre intersection of gaming and private enterprise. For a long time now, account selling has been a profitable scheme in World of Warcraft. Some sellers, like Shane Jeffrey, the self-proclaimed owner of a premium account reselling business, has supposedly managed to earn more than $425,000 from reselling alone. Is there really that much value in World of Warcraft accounts? Well, the most valuable World of Warcraft accounts tend to be ones that have obtained extremely uncommon items. Items that can require players to grind for hundreds of hours at a time, or overcome some of WoW's famously low drop rates. Many of these items come in the form of rideable mounts, like the Swift Spectral Tiger. This is a mount that was only obtainable through the Fires of Outland set of the World of Warcraft trading card game. To give you a little bit of an idea of its rarity, it's estimated that this mount is only owned by 3% of the player base. You got Arthas. You've got uh, Santa. Thrall. Whoa, my oh my god! Oh my god! I got it! I got it! Holy f! If you wanted to purchase this mount off a secondary market, you'd have to spend anywhere from $5,000 to $7,000. Even more rare, though, are the various items and mounts in World of Warcraft that are no longer obtainable, like the Scarab Lord mount, which was earned during the one-time Gates of Anchorage event in 2006. Even better than that, though, are the bonus gifts that were distributed in person at BlizzCon over the years. Gifts like Murky the Murloc Pet from BlizzCon 2005 that now sells for around $6,900. Because of their scarcity and the unique stories behind them, these highly sought after items serve as awe-inspiring status symbols for the few players that do own them. 
the value and rarity of an item becomes a whole lot more difficult to judge in games that allow you to convert real money into in-game currency. While it certainly seems to kill off third-party gold sellers in games like Guild Wars 2, it can have some really strange effects on the economy and the game's most prized artifacts. The pinnacle of gear in Guild Wars 2 has always been legendary weapons. These eye-catching armaments are known to take months of crafting and achievement hunting to create. However, if you're willing to inject your hard-earned dollars directly into cyberspace, you can bypass this process with relative ease, causing one of the key pillars of Guild Wars 2's endgame, generally the stuff you're supposed to work towards once you've reached level cap, to be erased with a few clicks of a button, along with whatever prestige legendary weapons were originally intended to have. Now, whether players like it or not, MMO developers seem to be pretty convinced that allowing players to convert cash into in-game currency is the way forward, or at least it's too profitable to ignore. But what about an MMO that lets you reverse that process and exchange the currency you earn in their virtual world into real-world cash? Yes, that game exists, and it's called Entropia Universe. Entropia claims to be the world's only cash-based MMO, and even has a set exchange rate like any other global currency. One of the results of this unique system is that Entropia is responsible for some of the most expensive items ever sold in a video game. The most expensive of which was Planet Calypso, which sold for $6 million, followed up by the asteroid resort Club Never Die for a comparably modest $635,000. Of course, when there's real money to be made, there will be people trying to gain an edge, fairly or otherwise. MMOs have been historically targeted by a pesky combination of scammers, bot farmers, and hackers. It's in games like these that the notorious hacker Manfred cut his teeth. For years, Manfred exploited critical bugs in a variety of online games like Wildstar, Lineage 2, and Lord of the Rings Online. Doing so, Manfred was able to make a pretty remarkable profit and remained relatively undetected until he called it quits sometime after 2014. However, when he was at the peak of his hacking powers, Manfred made enough money targeting these digital economies to fully support himself for over 20 years. He even reported all these earnings on his taxes. Everything, according to him, was completely above board, at least in terms of the law. So you might be asking, what was this secret knowledge behind his success? According to Manfred, almost every MMO he played, and he played nearly all of them, was susceptible to what are called integer overflows. Most games will have technical constraints that essentially limit the number of digits, or integers, that can be reasonably handled by the game engine. By using integer overflows, Manfred was able to trick the game into breaking that barrier causing all sorts of unintended side effects. For example, in Wildstar Online, Manfred used integer overflows to generate pretty much unlimited money. In this particular game, Manfred could create a bid on the in-game auction house set at the game's 64-bit integer limit, which was around 9 quintillion. The auction house would then add a 20% listing fee on top of this figure, stretching it to about 11 quintillion. Then, by subtracting 11 quintillion from his character's currency, the game would roll this number out of the negative and into the positive, giving Manfred the cap of 9 quintillion platinum. This amount of Wildstar platinum would have been worth 397 trillion US dollars. Unfortunately for Manfred, there was nowhere near enough demand for platinum for him to ever actually earn that much, but he was able to sell enough of it to make a living. As you might imagine though, not every player that wants to make money off of a video game will necessarily have the technical ability or know-how of someone like Manfred. For that reason, many players resort to exploiting simple but powerful bugs that can occur naturally, or at least with a little bit of encouragement. The holy grail of exploits for players like these are bugs that can result in item duplication. By duplicating items, exploiters can quickly build large amounts of in-game credits and stockpile rare or hard to obtain items to sell on in the future. Manfred, like many others, got his start in MMOs playing Ultima Online, which, because it was such an early pioneer of the MMO genre, had its fair share of technical oddities that could often lead to item duplication. Ultima was faced with a lot of mechanical challenges that MMOs of the future would be much better equipped to solve as technology became more advanced. A lot of these issues were related to how Ultima handled its zones. Every MMO takes a slightly different approach to the structure of their world. Some games operate instant zones requiring a loading screen every time you enter a new area, while others use more subtle techniques that allow zones to load in the background. If you've ever been funneled through a narrow tunnel or a hazy mountain pass to get to a new area in a game, this is very likely what's happening. In Ultima, the game world on each server was partitioned into sub-maps called area serves. This dynamic system was capable of passing players from one area serve submap to another with relatively little fuss and without having to wait for anything to load. 
When you crossed an area serve boundary, the game would basically copy your character and everything that they were carrying over to the next area serve, and then delete the data left over on the previous one. It was a surprisingly seamless solution for 1997. The only real way to tell you were crossing into another submap was usually a spike in latency. However, some area serve boundaries were a little bit worse than others and could cause some serious rubber banding, which resulted in your character kind of stuttering between the area serves before the game would eventually correct itself. Malicious players could use these especially problematic zones to duplicate, say, a chest full of loot by passing the chest off to a friend as you ran across these borders. Tim Cotton was the lead live events designer on Ultima during a period where duping exploits like these were especially prevalent. Because so much complexity had crept into the game over the years, Tim recalled the team feeling like they were constantly on the back foot regarding item duplication. From the beginning, Ultima had an extensive underground network of players who carefully guarded profitable bugs, some of which had been kept secret since the game's early beta testing phase. This intense secrecy and coveting of exploits was hard to combat on its own, but it was worsened by the fact that for many years the developers didn't have the proper tools needed to identify an item that was illicitly duplicated. This was primarily due to the lack of an easily searchable database, as you might expect in a more modern game. All the data for a server or shard was simply dumped into a binary backup file. These backups were then loaded on server startup in order to return the servers to their previously saved game state. So searching these binary files wasn't really an option. However, Cotton knew that dynamic objects in Ultima were capable of storing data and scripts on themselves that activated when the servers were loaded from the backup. So after consulting with the game's engineers, Cotton had himself a simple but effective tool that would finally help fight the Ultima Online duping epidemic. The solution was a global hash registry. Today, this cryptographic hash function is widely used to secure data and prove the legitimacy or uniqueness of a digital asset like Bitcoin or an NFT. Using this proof-of-work ledger technology, years before it would explode in popularity, Cotton created a list of all the most valuable items in the game that would be worthy of duping. The next time the servers loaded up, the items on this list would be marked with a hash of the current time, the area serve in which the object resided, and other unique data. Once the target object had a tag, it would notify the server to put it in a special lookup registry that could only be searched when the area serves loaded up. From this point forward, when a player duplicated an item, the same one-of-a-kind hash would also be duplicated to the new copy of the item, making dupes stand out like a sore thumb. Suddenly, the Ultima team had a list of almost all the duplicated items in the game. The next step was to figure out what to do with them, and more importantly, the players that they belonged to. The main problem here was that when players discovered a duping exploit, they wouldn't just keep all the duped items for themselves, they would sell them on, so many of these duped items eventually fell into the hands of regular players. It wouldn't have necessarily been fair or good for the game's population to ban every single player that had one. Luckily, by creating a registry of the duped items, the developers had, by extension, accidentally unearthed a massive duping ring that stretched across multiple servers. These players had been making a fortune selling dupes in-game and then selling the gold they made on secondary markets for a real-world profit. This operation had player homes that served as storage depots filled to the brim with duplicates. The main constituents behind these virtual cartels would be routinely banned, but Cotton, as the lead live events designer, thought they should take this opportunity to make an example out of them as well. After several weeks of watching and waiting, they finally struck. One day, as the servers loaded up, the devs instantly banned all the dupers en masse, and in a whirl of chaos and laughter, reduced their houses to a flaming rubble. The only thing left behind in the wreckage were straw dummies labeled an effigy of a traitor, an ominous warning to those interested in testing the game's limits. Tim wrote a brilliant article about this whole incident that I would highly recommend reading if you're interested in learning more of the details. And funnily enough, as far as I know, his article is the first time the story of what actually happened to these player homes has been shared. For a long time, this mysterious attack had been the subject of speculation and conspiratorial thinking, and had generally caused a big buzz in the Ultima community. It's not very often that developers go to war with cheaters, so to speak, but it does remind me of when a Guild Wars 2 hacker was stripped down to his undies and thrown from the upper tier of Divinity's Reach by a particularly zealous ArenaNet dev. As technology continues to advance, the battle for control over online spaces, even MMOs, will likely rage on, albeit probably with less virtual arson. Despite its age, Ultima provides a fascinating example of just how tightly technology and digital entertainment can be intertwined, remarkably foreshadowing the utility of blockchain tech. And it certainly makes you wonder if crypto and non-fungible tokens are on an inevitable collision course with gaming. 
If you've been paying attention, you may have noticed that the MMO market is already becoming oversaturated with crypto scam games. Rather coincidentally, Ultima creator Richard Garriott and former Ultima game designer Todd Porter have already tossed their hats into this CD ring. In July of 2022, with almost no media coverage or fanfare, they announced that they're working on a new Web 3.0 open world sandbox MMORPG called Iron and Magic that leverages blockchain based technology to build a game in which the foundation of the gameplay is centered on the cornerstones of player participation and ownership. Unlike many others in the space, Garriott and his team are committed to building a compelling world first and foremost, and recognize that not all players will be interested in the crypto or NFT aspects of the game. They've promised to give players the choice to opt out of these features entirely without negatively impacting their gameplay experience. While these new technologies can certainly be powerful tools in the creation of next generation MMOs, they also open up a whole host of new questions that need to be answered. What does a world built on the back of cryptocurrency mean for pay to win mechanics? How do you protect players' money in a game that supports real monetary investment? I mean, if regular games are targeted by hackers and scammers, imagine the amount of interest a crypto-backed MMO would attract. Not to mention the potential impacts this technology has on our real-life environment. Should we really be mixing our work and play by investing and storing our money in an entertainment medium? If you're someone who enjoys gaming on a grand scale and are interested in the strange future of the massively multiplayer genre, or if you find yourself captivated by the bizarre ways the drama and politics of reality can bleed into our virtual spaces, then I welcome you to join me in the future as I continue to delve into these topics. It's too hard, man. I, you know, I can't get enough gold. I mean, I just can't do it. And they're going, and they're going, oh no, man, but I had like 3,000 gold by the time I got to where you are. And I'm going, how, what in the world are you guys doing to do this? <laughs> Finally, after three or four weeks, we discovered because they were killing everybody along the way. <laughs>